be denied the right in community with the other members of their group to enjoy their own culture, to profess and practice their own religion, or to use their own language, end quote. In short, the right of religious minorities to practice their faith is meant to be protected. But we all know that in reality, governments often trample on the rights of religious, ethnic, and linguistic minorities. By the way, those three categories, religion, ethnicity, and ethnicity, language, often overlap. Since its founding in 2008, this commission has focused attention on many situations in which the rights of minorities have been grievously violated. Often the minorities have been Muslims, the Uyghurs in China, the Rohingya in Burma, Muslims in India. I cannot emphasize strongly enough that the two situations in the world today that the U.S. government considers to be ongoing genocides are the actions of the Chinese authorities against the Uyghurs uh, and the Burmese state uh, against Rohingya. It is not always the case that those express the, the, it is not always the case that those repressing Muslims are non-Muslims. The commission has also examined situations where the power of the state is exercised on behalf of a particular expression of Islam at the expense of others. Egypt, Saudi Arabia, Iran, Pakistan, and Bahrain all come to mind. We should not be surprised that a 2020 Pew report found a strong association between authoritarianism and government restrictions on religion. We have also seen how global efforts to combat terrorism in the aftermath of 9-11 have led to stigmatization against Muslims, including in Europe and even here at home. That bias um, has found its way into laws and policies, such as the French laws that discriminate against Muslim dress. The Russian government's two wars in Chechnya killed thousands of Muslims. More than half of the political prisoners in Russia today have been persecuted, at least in part due to their faith. In this hearing, we are taking a global view. Our, purpose, our purposes are first to highlight that Muslims, in all their diversity, are widely subject to government harassment and restrictions. They are at risk or already are victims of some of the most grievous human rights violations being committed as we speak. Second, we are here to think creatively about how best to defend the fundamental human rights of Muslims. We must continue to document and condemn grave violations of the, of the rights of Muslims. The United States government has important tools in hand for this purpose, including the State Department's annual report on international religious freedom and the excellent work done by the U.S. Commission on International Religious Freedom. In addition, we should be thinking creatively about how to pursue accountability in any and all appropriate jurisdictions, a topic our witnesses will address. We should also continue to develop and strengthen approaches that change the incentives for repressive states and other stakeholders. One example is the Uyghur Forced Labor Prevention Act that went into uh, effect this week, and I want to thank Co-Chair Smith for his uh, leadership uh, on that and so many other issues regarding human rights in China. But that act makes sure that goods produced with forced labor in Xinjiang cannot enter the U.S. market. It gives the private sector a stake in standing up for Uyghurs' rights and increases the cost of repression to the Chinese government. I was, I was proud, to, again, to, to uh, work with my colleagues on this bill, and I hope it brings about change. It is also past time to reconsider the military-led counterterrorism policies that too often seem to have contributed to human rights violations against Muslim populations. As we emphasized in a commission hearing last fall, both research and experience demonstrate that effective counterterrorism strategies place human rights and rule of law at their center. That is not where we are today. So I look forward to this hearing uh, and uh, look forward to uh, listening to what the witnesses have to say, their thoughts and recommendations on these and other aspects. And I now turn to Co-Chair Smith for his opening remarks. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chairman. And uh, uh, this is a very timely hearing, especially uh, in, in that it complements this week's important summit on international religious freedom. Uh, so uh, I thank you for that timeliness. And uh, it is very good to be working with you on so many important human rights issues, including uh, trying to protect uh, the Uyghurs from the genocide. And, and our legislation, and you were the prime sponsor, I was principal co-sponsor, uh, I think is going to make a difference. Um, so uh, let's hope, you know, um, that we are, it'll be implemented faithfully, and I have every belief that it will be. 
The advancement of religious freedom internationally should also be a core objective, as we all know, of U.S. foreign policy. Uh, I was uh, worked with Frank Wolf back in 1998. As a matter of fact, all the hearings were held in my subcommittee uh, to, uh, to pass the International Religious Freedom Act of 1998. And then I did the reauthorization of it and expansion of it, which we named after Frank Wolf for his great work uh, uh, just a couple of years ago. I've also introduced H.R. 7829 uh, currently uh, to reauthorize the U.S. Commission on International Religious Freedom. Uh, and I invite members uh, of Congress to co-sponsor this bipartisan legislation, which would allow USERF to continue its absolutely critical work to promote religious freedom throughout the world. As I said last year, and I continue to emphasize, however, religious freedom is under siege all over the world. While Christians are by far and away the most persecuted religious group in the world, we cannot overlook the persecution by two states in particular against predominantly Muslim minorities within their own countries, which I believe are tantamount to genocide, namely what the People's Republic of China under Xi Jinping is doing to millions of Uyghurs, Kazakhs, and other Turkic Muslims, and what the government of Burma is doing, as you pointed out, to the Rohingya people. In late May, we saw leaked photos, thousands of them, showing the inside of concentration camps in Xinjiang, Uyghur Autonomous Region, where the inmates are victims of forced labor, sexual exploitation, and even the horrific practice of forced organ harvesting. Last month, I chaired a hearing at our commission where we heard testimony regarding the barbaric harvesting of human beings in the prime of their life. According to Ethan Gutman, the coal rate among Uyghurs age 28, deemed by the Chinese medical establishment as the ideal age for ripe organs, um, it is estimated to be between 2.5 million, hold on one second, uh, 2.5 and 5% uh, per year based on consistent witness testimony from roughly 20 concentration camps in Xinjiang. And what motivates this cruelty? It is hatred directed at ethnicity and religion. We know that the communists hate all religion, Christianity, Falun Gong, Buddhism, but in the case of the Uyghurs and the other Turk and Central Asians, the targeted religion is predominantly Islam. Thus the CCP bulldozes mosques and shrines in Xinjiang which while well, leaked documents show that the order to commit genocide comes from Xi Jinping himself, where he is quoted as saying, show no mercy. I chaired a hearing uh, along with Marco Rubio in November of 2018, where a Uyghur woman named Mihargel Tursen testified how her jailers tortured her, tortured her by sending electrical currents coursing through her body. She said the pain was so intense that she pleaded that her life be ended. And why was she tortured like this? She even asked the torturer. He said, because you're a Uyghur, because you're a Muslim. We also see cruelty in Burma, where people are targeted because of ethnicity and religion, because one is Rohingya and one happens to be Muslim. During this 117th Congress, I've co-sponsored HRES 896, which officially condemned the Burmese military for perpetrating systematic gross violations against Rohingya, a Sunni Muslim ethnic minority. The armed attacks in 2016 and 17 against the group created a humanitarian and human rights crisis that is both saddening and maddening and outrageous, where over 9,000 Rohingya were killed, and which led to a huge exodus of the population into neighboring countries. More than 890,000 refugees are in Bangladesh alone, while 142,000 individuals are internally displaced. Long before this, however, the Burmese military, also known as the Tav Mandal, have systematically oppressed the Rohingya. I am thus grateful for the State Department's acknowledgement in March of 2022 uh, that members of the Tatman Yadal have committed genocide in crimes against humanity against Rohingya. I also want to add, however, that we also see persecution of Muslims in Muslim majority countries. Still today, for example, in Pakistan, Algeria, Malaysia, uh, Ahmadiyya, Muslims and Shia Muslims face legal, social, and political persecution. Same goes uh, for Nigeria, uh, where so many Muslims have been attacked by groups uh, like the Falun Gong, like the, um, uh, like the um, uh, uh, Boko Haram. In Pakistan's case, the Constitution specifically defines who is or who is not a Muslim. In addition, the Penal Code Ordinances notes that those who, quote, defiles the sacred name of the Holy Prophet shall be punished with death or imprisonment for life but oftentimes targets minority Christians and Hindus, but also the Ahmadiyya Muslims. 
Beyond state actors, extremist groups like ISIS, Boko Haram, and Al-Shabaab also continue their reign of terror, targeting both Muslims and non-Muslims. With that, we must redouble our efforts now more than ever to protect international religious freedom. I would like to thank our witnesses, the chair of USERF, Nuri Turkel, and ambassadors Rashad Hussein and Beth Van Shack. I look forward to your testimony and we really are grateful for your leadership and I yield back the balance of my time. Thank you very much. And um, I'm not sure whether Congresswoman Il Ilan Omar is on the line. Uh, if she is, I'm happy to yield to her for uh, an opening statement if she'd like. Um, thank, thank you, Chairman. I want to begin by thanking the co-chairs, Congressman McGovern and Congressman Smith for con convening this important hearing today. I also want to thank them for inviting me to co-chair this hearing. It's an honor for me to do so. I especially want to acknowledge their leadership on this issue. Representative McGovern has been a reliable champion of human rights for all people and a consistent partner and a friend as we work to combat the brutal repression of Muslims around the world. Rep. Smith has shown crucial leadership, particularly on the plight of Uyghurs in China and the Rohingya in Burma. When the House passed my bill to create a special envoy to combat Islamophobia last December, I talked about the need to connect the dots between the different violence expressions of Islamophobia in different parts of the world. At its worst, it's the atrocity crimes in China and Burma. And I'm looking forward to discussing America's response during our first panel. But there is also a growing level of violence and impunity for violence against Muslims in India, in Sri Lanka, and in Europe. There is serious repression of Muslim minority populations in Muslim majority countries like Bahrain, Saudi Arabia, and Pakistan. In Russia, Burma's government, uh, Putin's government, is putting down human rights organizations is shutting down human rights organizations and using their support for Muslim refugees as the reason. And one thing I believe we need to acknowledge when we connect the dots is that the United States has played a role in this, especially over the last 20 years, both with our actions and with our rhetoric. When Xi says the Chinese government needs to start using America's war on ter terror methods in Xinjiang, we should take notice. When the Burmese or Egypt or Russia's government justifies the treatment of Muslims based on perceived threat of terrorism, we should reflect on how our recent history of torture and arbitrary detention has contributed to those justifications. As always, we must lead by example. And as always, no religion, no religious minority is free until all of us are free. This is something our panelists know well. It's something Chairman McGovern and Smith know well. I look forward to this discussion. And once again, thank you all for having me. I yield back. Thank you very much, uh, Congresswoman Omar. Thank you for your leadership uh, on so many human rights issues as well. Um, I'm now happy to introduce our first panel. Uh, first panel. Rashad Hussein is the Ambassador at Large for International Religious Freedom at the US Department of State. He serves as principal advisor to the secretary and advisor to the president on religious freedom conditions and policy. Previously, he was the director uh, at the National Security Council's Partnerships and Global Engagement Directorate. From, 19, from two, 2015 to 21, he served as senior counsel um, in the Department of Justice's National Security Division. Ambassador Hussein has also previously, previously served as the special envoy to the Organization of Islamic uh, Cooperation, uh, OIC and uh, the U.S. Special Envoy for Strategic Counterterrorism Communications, among other posts. He received his JD from Yale Law School, his master's degree from in public administration and uh, Arabic and Islamic studies from Harvard University, and his bachelor's degree from the University of North Carolina. Dr. Beth Van Schock, um is the ambassador at large for global criminal justice at the U.S. Department of State. She advises the Secretary of State and Department leadership on issues related to the prevention of and re response to atrocity crimes, including war crimes, crimes against humanity, and genocide. 
She previously served as deputy to the ambassador at large um, from 2012 to 2013. Prior to rejoining the State Department, she was the Lee Kaplan Visiting Professor in Human Rights at Stanford Law School and directed Stanford's International Human Rights and Conflict Resolution Clinic. Her experience includes serving as the academic advisor to the United States Interagency Delegation to the International Criminal Court Review Conference um, in Kampala, Uganda, and practicing with the Office of the Prosecutor of the International Criminal Tribunals for Rwanda and the former Yugoslavia and the former Yugoslavia in The Hague. She's a graduate of Stanford, uh, uh, where she had her BA, Yale, where she had her JD, and Leiden, where she had her a PhD. So we are thrilled to have both of you here. Uh, Ambassador uh, uh, Hussein, uh, we will begin with you. Thank you so much, uh, Co-Chair McGovern, Co-Chair Smith, Representative Almar, and members of the Commission for inviting us to speak with you today about how we're seeking to advance respect for the freedom of religion all around the world. I'm really grateful to have this opportunity to serve uh, in the in the role uh, and to try to help people who are suffering around the world. My own parents, to just to tell you a little about my, my story, they came to the United States from India to seek the great opportunities that our country and its freedoms provide. I grew up as one of the very few Muslim Americans at my schools in Texas, uh, and I had the honor of working on Capitol Hill myself at the House Judiciary Committee on the staff for Congressman John Conyers uh, prior to law school, including on September 11, 2001. Uh, it was during law school uh, where we witnessed the election of the first Muslim American to Congress, Keith Ellison, and it really is an honor to testify in front of the representative from the same district today, Congresswoman Omar. Uh, after law school, I clerked for the late uh, Judge Damon Keith, who was one of the legal icons of the civil rights movement. And as part of my legal and diplomatic roles in both the Obama and Biden administrations, I've sought to protect the human rights and safety of people all over the world and to speak out against bigotry in all of its forms, uh, including anti-Semitism and anti-Muslim discrimination. In my current role, I'm sometimes asked this question, which is, who are you as the United States to assess or stand in judgment of religious freedom and human rights around the world? And I believe that we are uniquely situated to stand up for religious freedom around the world for a number of reasons. First of all, we ourselves are a country that was founded on religious freedom by individuals fleeing religious persecution. But second, our Constitution's Bill of Rights begins with the protection of human rights, including the freedom of religion. And we're also a country of immigrants. People come here from all over the world and they demand that their elected representatives and that their government promote uh, our values in, in the lands that they came from. And they would have it no other way. So who, so who are we to stand up for religious freedom around the world? In many ways, we are the representatives of the rest of the world gathered here in the United States. And we don't shy away from discussing our own efforts to seek a more perfect union. I believe it sends a powerful signal to the world that the last four ambassadors with the mission of protecting international religious freedom have been a Muslim, a Catholic politician, a Jewish rabbi, and an African-American Protestant minister. And the fact that we continue to work together says a lot about America and about the nonpartisan enduring commitment that we have to promoting freedom of religion around the world. Injustices, of course, abound globally, and religious adherents are sometimes falsely accused, wrongly, wrongfully sentenced, and unjustly imprisoned on account of their beliefs. Many people live under governments that prevent them from observing their faith traditions, and the United States calls for the freedom of religion or belief for every individual. That includes Muslims, that includes Muslim victims of genocide and crimes against humanity, including the Uyghurs in China and Rohingya in Burma. My early days in this position have been dedicated to addressing these issues. In April, I traveled to Cox's Bazar, Bangladesh, to visit uh, Rohingya refugee camps. There I learned firsthand about the challenges Rohingya have faced since fleeing brutal violence and persecution in Burma and how the United States can support them. Earlier this month, Secretary Blinken released the over 2,000 page report on international religious freedom. And the Secretary highlighted that China continues its genocide and repression of predominantly Muslim Uyghurs and other religious minority groups. He also described how religious freedom and the rights of religious minorities are under threat in communities around the world, including in places such as India, Nigeria, and Vietnam. 
Our commitment to freedom of religion or belief includes combating religious intolerance and discrimination in its unique manifestations, as well as advocating for change in discriminatory laws and policies. Religious nationalism, anti-Semitism, anti-Muslim hatred, and xenophobia are on the rise in many countries around the world. And technology, including social media platforms, have been used to spread hate speech and to incite violence by vilifying and threatening members of religious minority groups. We see governments use counterterrorism laws under the pretense of security or stability to limit freedom of expression and freedom of association. These laws are at times used to suppress peaceful dissent and to persecute members of religious minority groups. Too often, this discrimination results in increased resentment and fear that leads to unrest or violence as people defend their beliefs. Our office is working globally to address these issues. I recently met with members of the Organization of the Islamic Cooperation, including the Secretary General, to discuss their recent report on anti-Muslim sentiment around the world. And I also met with the French ambassador to discuss the rising trends that we see in Europe. And I look forward to collaborating with other like-minded partners to address critical issues. At close, I'd just like to speak a little bit about our work with civil society. Civil society, including women and youth, are the everyday in-country experts and change makers who are working in the trenches. And the youth in particular represent the emerging leaders of tomorrow in their, and in their zeal, they help change the status quo, push societies forward and solidify new norms. Women everywhere have been essential in promoting more diverse, equitable, inclusive and just societies that ensure the freedom of religion or belief for all. And we are grateful for their efforts and we continue to do whatever we can to support their inspiring leadership. Thank you again for inviting me today to testify. Thank you very much, Ambassador Van, Van uh, Skok. Thank you so much, Chairman McGovern, Chairman Smith, Representative Omar, and distinguished members of this commission. I'm really honored to be here with you today in my new capacity as Ambassador at Large for Global Criminal Justice and alongside my new colleague, Ambassador Hussein. Thank you also for holding this hearing on this timely and critically important topic. I was really pleased to be able to participate in the um, non-governmental summit this week as well. I deeply appreciate the work of the Tom Lantos Human Rights Commission as it promotes, defends, and advocates for international human rights really around the globe. As has been mentioned in the opening remarks, millions of Muslims are the victims of two contemporary genocides. One is being committed by authorities of the People's Republic of China against the predominantly Muslim Uyghurs, ethnic Kazakhs, ethnic Kyrgyz, and members of other ethnic and religious minorities in Xinjiang. The other is being committed by members of the Burmese military against the predominantly Muslim Rohingya. The Secretary of State of the United States has made public genocide determinations in both cases, and we continue to document these terrible crimes to help ensure that those responsible are held accountable and that the victims know that, know that they are being seen and heard. Genocide is not the only atrocity crime being committed in Xinjiang or against Rohingya. Crimes against humanity are also underway, and we, we do a disservice if to these victims and survivors when crimes against humanity are omitted from our condemnation, because they too are prohibited under international law and can be just as grave in their impact on communities who are targeted. For example, the United States has determined that crimes against humanity are underway in Xinjiang, and this includes acts of imprisonment or other severe deprivation of physical liberty and violation of fundamental rules of international law, enforced sterilization of women, the torture and other mistreatment of those detained, and persecution. And this includes the use of forced labor and the imposition of draconian restrictions on the freedom of religion or belief, the freedom of expression, and the freedom of movement. Secretary Blinken has also determined that members of the Burmese military are committing similar crimes against humanity against Rohingya, including the deportation of whole communities across international borders. The United States is committed to pursuing truth and justice for victims and for accountability of those atrocities. And that's the, really the remit of my office. Now, while ideally these crimes um, would be prosecuted in the courts of the countries in which they're occurring, we know that in many cases, and of course, when it comes to the PRC and Burma, there's no possibility of doing this in the immediate future. 
This means that those of us who are pursuing justice for these crimes need to look for other venues. This includes international mechanisms, international courts, and also foreign courts that are able to assert jurisdiction over these crimes. And we have started to see some success in the prosecution of atrocity crimes in international and foreign courts. And there are even nascent investigations addressing atrocities in Burma being pursued in Argentina, Australia, and Turkey. Now, while U.S. law allows for the prosecution of genocide, we don't have legislation that would allow us to prosecute those responsible for crimes against humanity in the PRC, in Burma, or elsewhere, if they were to fall within our jurisdictional reach. That said, we are committed to working with the many tools that we do have to address atrocities wherever they're being committed, including against Muslims in places like the PRC and Burma. So, for example, to address genocide and crimes against humanity against Rohingya and other atrocities in Burma, we are supporting the United Nations Independent Investigative Mechanism for Myanmar, the so-called IIMM, and Secretary Blinken just announced an additional $1 million pledge of support to that institution. We're also supporting the Gambia, who on behalf of the OIC has brought a case against Burma before the International Court of Justice under the Genocide Convention. It's an, a very unprecedented action, and it's been inspiring to see the Gambia step up to support the, their, their um, Rohingya brethren and also the norms underlying the Genocide Convention. Alongside U.S. allies and partners, we are imposing targeted sanctions on top military commanders and senior officials within Burma and leading efforts at the United Nations calling for the end of the provision of arms to the Burmese military. We're also continuing to support efforts to document atrocities against Rohingya and other um, atrocities in Burma through victim and survivor-centered approaches. And the United States continues to provide significant support to help meet the immediate, immediate humanitarian needs of the Rohingya and other displaced Burmese. Similarly, we're committed to promoting justice and accountability for the PRC's genocide and crimes against humanity against Uyghurs, including forced labor and members of other ethnic and religious minorities in Xinjiang. We have important authorities like the Global Magnitsky Sanctions Program that allow the United States to take strong action against individuals and entities that are implicated in the PRC's atrocities. Congress has also generated really new and important tools, such as the Uyghur Forced Labor Prevention Act, to help prevent the importation of products made with forced labor in Xinjiang to the United States. This imposes significant tangible costs on those engaged in or complicit in forced labor in Xinjiang. We've also been able to utilize visa restrictions, export controls, financial sanctions, import restrictions, these are all examples of how the United States is leading the way in imposing costs on individuals and entities in connection with genocide and crimes against humanity in Xinjiang. And the State Department is working diplomatically with our friends and partners to encourage them to emulate these measures. The United States has long supported efforts to promote justice and accountability for atrocity crimes. We're not letting up even as atrocities continue to mount around the world. It's not only a moral imperative, but it's in our national interest. And we know that the American people care deeply about these issues. So thank you members of the Lantos Commission for your dedication, for the vital legislative tools that enable us to pursue justice for atrocity crimes and for your keen and enduring interest in these issues. I really look forward to our conversation. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you both for your excellent testimony. Let me begin with the questions. Um, you know, there has been quite a bit of recent reporting about calls for violence against Muslims in India, including by some Hindu activists and religious leaders. Some commentators are suggest suggesting that conditions could be uh, conducive to violence, and some have already warned of a risk of, risk of genocide. Uh, Yusuf has... Um, has recommended that India be designated as a um, uh, uh, as a country of um, uh, of particular concern. Uh, Ambassador Hussein, what is your assessment of the situation in Indi in India? Why hasn't the administration accepted the USERF recommendation? Uh, in your view, what kind of engagement by Congress would be most constructive or helpful? Well, thank you so much, uh, Congressman. Um, as I mentioned earlier, uh, my own family is from India. It's a country that I love. It's a great country, so it's sad to see what's happening there. Um, we are concerned with the targeting of a number uh, of communities in India, including Muslims, Christians, 
Sikhs. I've met with uh, Christians uh, from India yesterday uh, at the summit. I met with uh, members of the Sikh community a couple of days ago as well. Also concerned about the Hindu Dalit community and, and, and indigenous communities uh, there as well. And in our recent uh, International Religious Freedom Report, which we released a few weeks ago, we had a 34-page section on India. And as Secretary Blinken said recently, we're regularly engaging with our Indian partners and we're monitoring uh, recent concerning developments in India, including human rights abuses by some government, police, uh, pr and prison officers uh, as well. Um, and he'd noted that, we, that we've seen rising attacks on people and places of worship there. Uh, the U.S. Holocaust uh, Museum and its early warning project recently listed India uh, <laughs> second on its list of countries with potential uh, for mass killings. And civil society organizations that we work with regularly around the world uh, have cited the citizenship law in India, open calls for genocide, as you noted, uh, attacks on churches, uh, dehumanizing language from government officials, um, demolitions of, of homes. Uh, and, and these are issues that I spoke at, at length yesterday um, in, in, in my remarks at the International Religious Freedom Summit. And uh, we're continuing to uh, encourage the government to condemn violence and to hold accountable all people who engage uh, in criminal activity and to protect all uh, groups in India. I, I recently met with our uh, the head of our embassy in New Delhi just uh, actually last week uh, as a part of these efforts. With regard to the uh, question on the countries of particular concern, we work very closely with USERF. I greatly value their recommendations. We've just put out uh, the International Religious Freedom Report a few weeks ago, and, and then in the coming months, we make the evaluations as to which um, uh, countries will be placed uh, on list. We go through all the countries in the report to make those assessments about uh, countries of particular concern and special watch, watch list countries. And I, I really appreciate your continued uh, focus uh, on human rights all over the world, including in India, um, and for having this hearing to, to shed a light, cast a light on what's uh, what's happening there uh, and in other places that you mentioned, including China uh, and, and Burma. Ambassador Hussein, what, what obstacles do you face in your efforts to promote human rights, uh, including the right to religious freedom and accountability for grave violations internationally? And and what role can legislators play to, to better facilitate uh, engagement on these issues? Are there specific gaps in our legal framework or, or other kinds of issues that we in Congress should be addressing? We've had great support uh, from Congress. I mean, the Uyghur uh, Forced Labor Prevention Act is, a, is an incredible example of how we can work together and really put teeth into what we're trying to do with regard to the People's Republic of, of China. Of course, uh, we have, as, as part of our report in our office, uh, outlined in great detail what's happening uh, in China, and not just with uh, the, the Uyghur community, but so many of the other communities are the Tibetan Buddhists, the Falun Gong uh, Christians, uh, and others. Um, and so we believe that legislation uh, such as Uy Uyghur Forced Labor Protection Act uh, is very helpful. I think it's important as an administration and as uh, as a government, uh, including in our cooperation uh, with, with Congress, that we continue to emphasize that uh, the more we protect human rights and international religious freedom uh, in particular, the more we can help advance uh, the, the other aspects of our um, international uh, strategy with regard to um, uh, uh, security efforts uh, with regard to our bi uh, bilateral important bilateral relationships around the world i think oftentimes uh, the two are seen as somehow trading off as if if we uh, push too hard on advancing human rights it'll somehow trade off with other aspects of our bipartisan of, of our bilateral relationship and i in my, in my experience it's actually just the opposite it's that it's been the case that when we uh, protect human rights and international uh, uh, religious freedom, we bring more stability uh, to societies. And when we don't, we see instability. Uh, and when we raise these issues with countries, as we do both publicly and privately, there's a level of respect that's accorded. And if we're if we're silent, uh, then I think that uh, we're taken for granted uh, by not raising the critical issues uh, that are important to raise. So, in terms of the legislative tools. Uh, that exist. I think that uh, you know we're well equipped um, with a full range of diplomatic uh, tools in our toolkit, uh, including the ability to in institute uh, sanctions for human rights violations, including religious freedom violations, uh, visa restrictions, uh, and the, the the Congress has been 
tremendously supportive of the Office of International Religious Freedom. We have uh, the resources that we need. We have a staff of about 42 uh, people here, and that's excluding the staff that comes in to work on a report every year that's divided up into uh, countries and topic areas and regions that we're working on all, all around the world. So we pre greatly appreciate your support. Thank you. Ambassador uh, Van Schock, let me ask you the same question. Yeah, from, from my perspective, I did make mention of the fact that the United States has no crimes against humanity statute. We do have a genocide statute, and of course, that could be applicable in the two cases that I discussed in my opening remarks. But genocide is very difficult to prove. It requires evidence to a criminal law standard that the perpetrator is acting with the intent to destroy the group in whole or in part, or in substantial part as it is under US law. That can be very difficult to prove absent some sort of a memorandum or you know, statement of intent by perpetrator groups or a regime like the, the PRC. And so crimes against humanity can fill that gap um, it includes many of the same acts, killing members of the group, subjecting them to mistreatment, forcible deportation, um, other forms of, of mistreatment, and persecution is an enumerated act, and specifically religious persecution is called out in many authoritative definitions of crimes against humanity. And so if our Department of Justice were able to exercise jurisdiction over potential perpetrators and were concerned that they couldn't meet the high bar of genocide, it would be helpful to have a crimes against humanity statute to fall back on in order to press those charges. So that's one area where I do see a, a significant gap in US authorities. Well, Ambassador, let me also, you know, you know, where do you see the greatest opportunities to, to strengthen or reinforce U.S. leadership on accountability for crimes against humanity and or geno and genocide at the international level? I think there's a lot we can do to build stronger coalitions in this regard, and we're doing that now with respect to some of the pieces of legislation that you have created. And so, for example, the Global Magnitsky Act, for a while the United States was out there alone. Now we're starting to see friends and partners emulate that legislation. And the more these responses can be multilateral, the harder it will be for perpetrators to find uh, fertile ground in order to do business, to travel, to vacation, et cetera. So we really need to tighten the net um, across areas where perpetrators may be moving. And so the Uyghur Forced Labor Protection Act, I'm, I'm very hopeful that some of our friends and partners will start to emulate that as well. So those markets are also closed off to, to goods that are made and, and infected essentially with forced labor against um, against Uyghur individuals who are subject to detention, forced labor, mistreatment, et cetera. And let me just ask one last question of you both. I mean, if you could identify one action Congress could take to counter anti-Muslim stigmatization, uh, discrimination, and persecution, um, what would that be? I, I think that our uh, continued support for human rights and, the, and some of the tools uh, that, the, that the ambassador mentioned are, are critical, uh, particularly now when we're seeing uh, crimes against humanity against two Muslim populations, uh, the, the Uyghurs and Rohingya, and potential uh, for other mass atrocities around the world. So filling in those gaps, I think, legislatively, as the ambassador uh, eloquently described, uh, would be particularly uh, important at this time. And it's important to note, again, that our office is uh, concerned about all religious communities and, and people of no faith all around the world. Um, and when you have these types of atrocities occurring against one group, they can occur against any. And so to have that gap filled uh, to protect people of all faiths uh, is critical. And I would just add, I think, going farther upstream, before you can have accountability, there has to be accurate documentation. And so continuing to invest in non-governmental efforts, governmental efforts, international multilateral efforts to document the crimes committed against religious minorities and others who would be subject to genocide and crimes against humanity is incredibly important. And we know that regimes like the PRC are incredibly adept at generating mis and disinformation. And so it's important to be able to authenticate what we're hearing coming out of these areas. And the China situation is, is particularly um, grave in this regard because they have such tight control over information. They don't allow independent experts in to monitor. When the High Commissioner Bachelet went, they were able to propagandize her visit. And so it wasn't able to advance necessarily the cause of individuals subject to abuses. And so we need to have independent voices that are able to document, collect, authenticate, and then ultimately share with 
accountability um, um, institutions. We have options when it comes to Rohingya crimes because the International Criminal Court has been seized of these actions. Bangladesh is a party to the ICC statute. And so because the, the, the crimes involve the coercion of Rohingya communities and forcibly sending them across a border or creating such conditions of life that it's impossible for them not to flee across an international border, that has triggered ICC jurisdiction. Because the PRC's actions are almost in, purely internal, that option does not exist before the ICC. Likewise, the International Court of Justice is able to exercise jurisdiction precisely because the Gambia stepped forward under the Genocide Convention in forcing that treaty on behalf of the international community against Burma. And so we should look for ways to be supportive of those efforts wherever there's a possible pathway to justice. Thank you both. I now yield to Co-Chair Smith. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chairman. Uh, you know, I think uh, Ms. Omar made a very good point about the pretext of 9-11. I remember when, uh, as 9-11 was unfolding and obviously many people in my district were killed, uh, who were in the Twin Towers, uh, the Chinese Communist Party quickly went into overdrive to suggest that they were in solidarity with us uh, for our loss, but also that the Uyghurs uh, uh, were a terrorist group. And I called the uh, Bush people immediately and said, please don't in any way buy into that narrative because the Uyghurs are not terrorists, but they're using this crisis here and trying to get a false sense of solidarity with us on 9-11 uh, in order to promote that. So I appreciate her bringing up the, you know, the, the pretext of 9-11. You know, there were some extremely bad apples who did horrible things, uh, but it is in no way indicative of other Muslims. I'll never forget on one trip that I made to Nigeria. I went to Nigeria many times. I went to Jos where I met with Archbishop Kegama, whose many churches were firebombed uh, by the Boko Haram. But I also, in talking to him, learned his deep respect for the Iman and the Muslim leaders in Jos. Uh, and they were like joined at the hip in terms of friendship and solidarity uh, in combating the extremeness of uh, Boko Haram. So I went over and met with uh, the Islamic leaders, the, Isla the uh, leaders, the Muslim leaders, uh, and they were equally flattering about the archbishop and said, I remember, never forget, one of them said, we don't know who this Boko Haram is. They're not us. And so I have been, you know, there, there have been many instances like that. Ray Surich in, in Bosnia, who was the Grand Mufta, uh, he and I became very good friends. Uh, and he said the same thing about these unbelievable radicals who do not uh, represent Islam. So I think every time we get a chance to say that, we need to say it. So uh, I thank Ms. Omar for bringing out that, that point about the 9-11. You know, I would also say, um, you know, the idea of when, when Pompeo made the designation about the um, uh, Xinjiang and, and the Chinese Communist Party being uh, committing genocide against the Uyghurs, um, uh, Secretary Blinken, you know, in a seamless way, said the same thing, you know, that there was a continuity of, of findings there. So I'm just wondering, you know, uh, I remember when we went through the whole issue of ISIS, uh, again, a radicalism that was unbelievable, uh, and it took an act of Congress uh, uh, or a resolution, a, a sense of the House resolution, to put just every, everybody was on board saying what ISIS is doing, trying to destroy people in whole or apart. Um, um, and I've been to that region of the world myself and met with a lot of the Chaldean Christians and others. Uh, it was a genocide. I mean, you could say in whole there, that was their intent, wipe them off the face of the earth but you could at least reach the, the standard of import. So Ambassador Van Schack, uh, 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 it is a the operating finding of the Department of State that what's being committed by Xi Jinping in Xinjiang is genocide, correct? That is correct. Absolutely. Great. This administration shares the views of, of Secretary Pompeo, and you're right, it was actually absolutely seamless, and we have bipartisan support in that regard. That's fantastic. Thank you. Um, let me just, uh, with regards to utilization of CPC uh, and the 18 or so um, uh, uh, sanctions that flow from it, because I was part of working on those back in 1998 uh, on the Wolf Bill. Uh, <clears throat> one of them was the idea of visa denial. And the only person, to my knowledge, that was ever sanctioned vis-a-vis -vis the IRFA, Interreligious Freedom Act, was uh, Modi. 
uh, for the allegations that were serious and seemingly s substantiated, even though he was cleared by a, um, uh, an internal investigation, uh, when he was the um, uh, governor of Gujarat, uh, that he ordered that, uh, and, or at least was complicit in the killing of a number of Muslims, something on the order of 800. Um, my hope would be, and this is just a, an encouragement, uh, that the sanctions part of, because um, I am worried, Ambassador Hussein, like you are, with this deteriorating trend in India uh, towards people of faith uh, that are different than Modi, uh, but especially the Muslims. So I, I would hope that uh, we would all ratchet up that concern. But to use, you know, if they get on CPC, I would hope uh, that you would utilize very, very aggressively the the sanctions that are prescribed in the law. Uh, because one of the things I have heard over the years, and when I did the reauthorization, we heard it even more as we were gathering information about what needs to be reformed, updated, and, and uh, enlarged upon, uh, was that the sanctions aren't used enough, uh, that they they sit there. And, you know, these countries aren't stupid. They're not, they, you know, they're very, very savvy as to what goes on. If they think it's a mere slap on the wrist with a designation, with no follow-up, uh, they take that as, well, we can endure a little criticism, but there's nothing tangible that's going to injure us. So I would just hope you would take that uh, under consideration, Mr. Ambassador, both ambassadors, uh, because I do think uh, we need to, you know, really met out sanctions. Uh, the more we do it, the more consistent and predictable we are, the better. Uh, and um, so I, I would say that. Uh, now, in terms of um, other venues, as you mentioned, uh, Ambassador Van Sh uh, Schack, uh, and I thank you for saying that. I held a hearing recently, uh, chaired it, uh, and uh, David Crane, who did a wonderful job in prosecuting in Sierra Leone, as you know so well, uh, he came back very strongly and said, you know, it's not just the ICC. If it could work, great, but it, largely it has not worked. And, and, you know, there's a lot of influence that the Chinese government and the Russians, but especially the Chinese could, you know, utilize in getting them to pull their punches. Um, and most of the prosecutions have been sub-Saharan Africa. I mean, it's just, why, why aren't the Chinese Communist Party being held to account? Um, but he also said something that, you know, maybe you've taken into consideration, and that is that the General Assembly can pass war crimes tribunals. You know, it could be maybe not a hybrid or could be a hybrid. It could be something akin to what, you know, Rwanda, Yugoslavia, and <clears throat> and uh, Sierra Leone were all about, uh, where you got real prosecutions, and I think we got better over time in terms of, and then, you know, you, you train up a whole cadre of people who are much better at doing it after the fact. I wrote a, a bill called the Iraq and Syria Genocide Prevention and Accountability Act. It was the prime author of it. Uh, and we had a whole data collection in there, and you know it, uh, to try to make sure we hold people to account for what was done uh, to those fleeing people during that genocide. So I, I just um, would hope that you would consider um, the idea of a General Assembly effort. Um, you know, if the ICC is going to do it, fine, but do it. You know, don't wait. You know, that was part of the problem with Yugoslavia. You know, Milosevic had done his terrible, terrible bloodletting, as did Milotic and all the others. Then years later, they were in the process of being held to account. Of course, Milosevic died before his trial was over. So, uh, you know, say with Charles Taylor. He's there for 50 years now at, at The Hague uh, under in a jail cell. But that said, it didn't happen in any kind of anything close to real time. And I think right now, with this horrible, horrible deal in Xinjiang, um, I would hope that we could look to, you know, do something there uh, with the General Assembly. And not everybody, you know, it might be harder, easier to get a Russian one because the Russians don't have the influence anymore in the General Assembly. China might, but it's worth investigating and looking at it. Uh, uh, and finally, if I could, um, there are two last things, um, you know, um, or one last thing, uh, uh, Ambassador Hussein, uh, if you could, look at Nigeria and look to put them back on CPC. Uh, the USERF uh, was very disappointed in that, as was I, as was everyone else uh, that was following in country. Um, you know, Buhari has, has, has really, you know, shown, I think, a lawlessness towards the Christians with the Fulani and Boko Haram, but also to fellow Muslims. You know, um, one thing I learned working the issue of the Coptic Christians from Muslims is that when there's a vibrant Coptic Christian uh, presence, it has a chilling effect on extremism by radical Muslims. 
Uh, you know, they, 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 they help keep a, a balance. Um, and now we have a situation where there's, uh, if ever a country needed to be put back on uh, CPC, I would respectfully suggest it would be Nigeria. Let them change their behaviors, uh, start cracking down. I mean, I, I, just one final thing. When Boko Haram was committing its terrible atrocities, I held several hearings in, in my subcommittee on human rights in Africa, uh, several hearings during the Obama administration. And um, the assistant secretary uh, uh, for uh, Johnny Carson testified and said, they're doing this to embarrass good luck Jonathan. I said, no, they're doing this because they have a very serious agenda. For three years, I asked them to designate Boko Haram as a, as a uh, 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 FDA, foreign terrorist organization, FDO, and, and they wouldn't do it. I finally introduced the bill. The day I was going to mark it up, the State Department said, yep, they're a foreign terrorist organization. Several days late, dollars short, because they already were much further entrenched. It might have had an impact had we done it much sooner. So I think we've, we've miscalculated, for whatever reason, for so long. And under Buhari, things are getting worse. Um, in this case, mostly the Christians are being killed, but so are Muslims. And that, that's been my takeaway of every trip to, and every meeting I have here in the office or anywhere else uh, with Nigerians, that, that the Muslims are being hurt, Christians more so, but the Muslims are being hurt and killed as well. So if you could uh, address some of that, I'd appreciate it. Thank you. Yeah, thank you so much. I really appreciate your leadership over the years um, for international religious freedom uh, and human rights. And uh, you know, I've told the, the team here that we're gonna follow the facts, we're gonna follow the law. And so when the when the data comes in, reports come in from our embassies and from civil society organizations around the world, we put together our report as we just did a few weeks ago. And then, and then the next step will be to assess uh, which countries are the CPC countries and the special watch list uh, countries. Uh, I've had a chance to visit uh, Nigeria uh, during my previous stint um, in, the, in the State Department and worked really closely with civil society leaders there, had sh shared the same experience as you, meeting with Christian leaders and Muslim leaders working together to try to find solutions to the violence there, short-term, medium, long-term solutions. Um, had a chance to engage uh, with the government, including with uh, President Buhari. Um, and so we need to see uh, accountability there. Uh, we also need to see a change in some of the uses of blasphemy laws. We'd like to see the elimination of blasphemy laws. They're used to target uh, minority communities, and that's true in other uh, places around the world as well. Uh, and it's been uh, a, a significant uh, portion of, of the work that I've done in international religious uh, freedom in, in previous roles uh, is to work toward the elimination of laws that are designed to criminalize speech as a way of addressing uh, intolerance because they actually usually have the opposite uh, effect. They, they tend to amplify bad speech more when people are, are arrested for their speech or for their depictions. Those arrests actually cause the depictions oftentimes to be amplified throughout the media. Um, and then those laws are sometimes used to target uh, religious minorities and political opponents. So that, the, the, that's an issue that we raise regularly with our uh, uh, counterparts around the world. I spoke about it yesterday. And soon we'll have a, a, a campaign here in our office uh, to um, uh, lead the charge against uh, uh, blasphemy laws around the world. Ambassador. Quickly on the on the ICC, your points are very well taken. Um, I'm pleased that there's new leadership now, and there has been a very extensive reform and review process that is hopefully going to strengthen the court and enable it to better carry out its core mandate. We are seeing an expansion geographically of matters. In fact, only this morning or maybe yesterday, Hague time, um, the court confirmed arrest warrants against two Russian nationals involving the Georgia matter. We also have the court taking up Ukraine and uh, the, the Rohingya matter as well. And so we're seeing an expansion. But you know, my, my longtime friend and colleague, um, David is correct that there are multiple modalities that we should be pursuing in order to create tribunals, particularly if the ICC is foreclosed for, you know, because of the way its jurisdictional structure was built into the, the treaty that created the court. And we may be able to build a lot of um, diplomatic energy within the General Assembly to do more. As it stands, um, in, in certain areas, the, the domestic courts are able to operate, but in the two cases we've mentioned, they haven't been. 
And just one more area to point out where I think the U.S. could be doing more, which I neglected to mention earlier, and that is with respect to witness protection. This is the soft underbelly of any justice effort. Witnesses are under assault in many of these situations. Their names, even if we try and keep them anonymous, they eventually leak, they become public, their families are threatened, they're intimidated, they're all sorts of you know things are dangled in front of them. So I'm wondering if there might be an opportunity to create some legislation that would better enable us to provide a safe haven for individuals who are giving testimony in either domestic or international cases that are involving religious persecution. Thank you so much. Thank you. I yield back, uh, Mr. Chairman, and thank you very much to our distinguished witnesses. Thank you very much. I yield to Congresswoman Omar. Uh, thank you, Chairman. Um, Ambassador uh, Vance Cog, I wanted um, to, <clears throat> I just want to start uh, with you. I recently um, was honored to join parliamentarians from several countries around the world uh, who launched an international parliamentary inquiry into the international response um, to the coup in Burma. Um, one important focus for me in that inquiry is the treatment of Rohingyas both before and after the coup. Uh, beyond additional um, support announced for the independent investigation mechanisms for Myanmar, has there been any change um, in U.S. policy since the U.S. Um, made a genocide determination um, for crimes committed against the Rohingyas in Burma? Yes, thank you so much for that question. And as mentioned, the IIIM, which you just invoked there, has a much broader jurisdiction than the ICC, and they are looking specifically at other atrocities against peaceful protesters, pro-democracy advocates, et cetera, that have been attacked during the in the post-coup era. So the jurisdiction of that body is much broader. It's it's run by an American with a long time history of um, working within international institutions and prosecuting international crimes. In terms of the change of policy, we are trying to tighten the 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 net, as I mentioned, on various sanctions regimes and looking for additional potential targets. We've just recently um, was confirmed uh, our sanctions coordinator. And he's been very focused on Ukraine, but really interested in looking more broadly at other places. And so we've been looking at the, um, the situation in Burma in particular to look for other ways in which to expand sanctions within that particular area. We're also hoping to provide an other forms of assistance to these cases that I mentioned that are happening in domestic courts. There's an opportunity, as I mentioned earlier, the, the witness question, there's an opportunity for some witnesses to testify before them. They probably cannot go back to Cox's Bazaar because their absence will be noted. We know that there are individuals within Cox's Bazaar who are essentially spies for the Tatmadaw military. And so they're going to need a safe place to go. And so we're looking for ways to be of assistance in that regard as well. And and what um, kind of support uh, directly are we providing or are able to provide um, in these cases in the ICC and the ICJ? In some respects, it's information sharing. So individual lawyers will come and ask for assistance. And so we will work with our intelligence community um, and to, to determine whether or not we have information that can be shared. And what we end up doing with many of these investigative bodies is to create essentially an information sharing arrangement whereby we can share even information that remains classified for their lead and background purposes. So they can then use that to help frame their investigations and help identify particular targets or incidents that are worth their investing their always limited um, investigative, investigative um, resources into. We can also provide a lot of diplomatic support. So we've been hoping to help the Gambia essentially fund its legal bills and hoping that the OIC would do more in that regard because they have the resources to do so, whereas Gambia does not. It's, it's not entirely a pro bono action. So that sort of diplomatic support we can be doing. Um, and then also this question of witness protection, how can we assist witnesses to provide testimony in a way that is secure and then make sure that their families have um, a safe place to go afterwards so that they are not targeted or retaliated against for what they're doing. So there's lots of things. We're always looking for ways to be helpful in connection with the lawyers that are involved in these cases. And and if I if I may, I I, I wanted you to maybe uh, say a little bit about what what it says um, uh, about the the international communities and countries 
with resources that um, the Gambia is the one that was able to um, initiate this case. Yeah, it's it's quite inspiring. Um, now they are doing so on behalf of the OIC. That was sort of the arrangement, and so they stepped forward and put their name on that petition to the International Court of Justice. We've also seen similar cases from, for example, um, Canada. The Netherlands have brought cases against Syria or have initiated cases under the Torture Convention. This is somewhat of a new phenomenon, um, and I think it's one that we should be encouraging because many of these international human rights treaties provide for International Court of Justice jurisdiction for disputes arising out of the interpretation or enforcement of the treaty, and this includes state responsibility. Now, these are not criminal cases, and so you need the International Criminal Court or domestic courts to be able to, to press criminal charges against specific individual perpetrators. But so often, as we've been talking about today, these are state policies. And so there should also be an opportunity to pursue state responsibility for what we're seeing um, in terms of violence against religious minorities, ethnic minorities, and others. Um, th thank you. And uh, Ambassador um, Hussein, I know that you recently traveled to um, uh, Bangladesh, and as uh, the ambassador was just uh, talking about witnesses and others needing protection, I know that um, uh, refugees, Rohingya refugees, are um, not being in um, in safe situations. What what can there be done for um, uh, for progress to to be improved um, uh, in regards to their conditions? Well, thanks so much for the question. <clears throat> One of the really um, big concerns that we have with regard to uh, Rohingya in Cox's Bazaar is that we we fear of losing a whole generation of youth, um, and that is because they have not been able to get access to good education. Um, even some of the efforts that Rohingya have tried to develop on their own uh, have been at times shut down by the government because the government of Bangladesh doesn't want to give the impression to the public that they're going to be there for the long term. And so the more that uh, permanent like uh, structures or institutions are set up, uh, uh, it, it, it gives them pause because it sends a signal uh, that they're going to continue to be there. The reality is that by opening up uh, Basan Shar, um, uh, for hosting uh, uh, refugees, which is a more permanent structure, the government is acknowledging that the repatriation cannot occur uh, at any time in the immediate future. Um, and so we urge the government of Bangladesh, when, when I met with uh, um, senior leaders there, to uh, at the very least uh, allow Rohingya to empower themselves, some of the learning centers that they're setting up, uh, and to also allow them to pursue some economic opportunities. They're setting up shops within the camps, for example, uh, and even some of those efforts uh, have been stymied by the government. The government has, has gone to greater lengths to, to stop them from going outside the camps and, and seeking employment because they're concerned about perceptions of trade off uh, with, the, with the host communities. And so what we've tried to do with our assistance is to make sure that we're supporting uh, Rohingya and we're also supporting uh, the host communities there together. And we impress upon them that uh, if we look at other inter international contexts from the past, the better that the more that we support uh, the refugee community, it actually is better for the host communities uh, as well. And so we point to other examples and, and continue to have those conversations, difficult conversations with the government at the same time, of, of course, expressing our appreciation for them hosting nearly a million people. Um, but that's uh, there, there's a lot of uh, international organizations, uh, including those led by the UN that are doing excellent work there. We had a chance to, uh, to meet with, um, and we're encouraging, uh, as Ambassador Van Schack said, uh, other countries to really step up. I, when I was meeting with the Secretary General of the OIC and the head of the Islamic Development Bank, um, I expressed our uh, frustration that um, oftentimes as institutions that claim to be protectors of, of Muslim communities around the world, uh, they just have failed to be as vocal as they need to be with regard to Rohingya and uh, with Uyghurs and, and others around the world. Um, as a multilateral institution, and also some of the individual member states. We raise it with the member states uh, whenever I meet with their country ambassadors or foreign ministers. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, we, we'd like to see more international co uh, cooperation in this area. Yeah, um, I, I, I share that gratitude too, uh, you know, as, as someone who was uh, a refugee, I'm both um, grateful for neighboring Kenya that that allowed for uh, my my family and I to 
to escape and seek refuge into the United States for giving us a, a permanent home and the ability to stabilize our lives. But I also do understand what, what happens when you are languishing um, as, as a child in a refugee camp and the, the missed educational opportunities. I spent four years without um, having the, the ability to get an education. I think it's really important that, um, that we continue to emphasize soil. Uh, thank, thankful for you uh, for, for doing that. There's also concern about deportations um, of Rohingyas that's that to back to, to Burma that's happening uh, in India and, and other places. And I, I do hope uh, that the United States will um, uh, raise its concern uh, ar around that. Um, I wanted uh, Ambassador Hassan to to switch and, and talk a little bit about India. Last week, I introduced a resolution with Chairman McGovern as the original co-sponsor calling on the State Department to accept USERV's advice and designate India as a country of particular concern. Uh, the resolution actually quotes you, Ambassador Hassan. Um, and as you know, the situation for religious minorities in India, especially Muslims and Christians, is deteriorating quickly, um, as you'd alluded to uh, in, in your remarks. Um, uh, genocide Watch has India on the eighth stage of genocide. Um, you mentioned how the Holocaust Museum has listed it as number two country of concern. Um, we have uh, ambassador designated um, uh, partner countries, countries that we have uh, strong relationships with, like Saudi Arabia, um, as countries of concern. Uh, what is the actual holdup in um, us designating uh, India as a country of concern? Uh, as uh, Chairman uh, Smith was was saying, you know, when we wait too long bad things happen um, and uh, and, it, and it, it becomes too late. And if there is all of these uh, alarming signs that are telling us that there is genocide afoot and we are we are we ourselves in the in, in the United States are not taking that seriously, that does say something about who we are and what um, kind of values we hold. So can you please tell us what why we have decided not to designate India as a country of concern? Yeah, so uh, one of the things that I told our team uh, when I came into this position a few months ago is that we're going to follow uh, the, the facts on the ground. We're going to follow the law when we come up with our recommendations that that feed into the broader process to make those ultimate determinations of which countries are countries of particular concern and which countries go on the special watch list. So the, the first step of the process to is, is to issue the report, uh, International Religious Freedom Report, which we issued just a few weeks ago. As I mentioned, there's a you know 34 page section uh, on India. Um, and uh, just as we do with all other countries, we'll now be in the process of determining which countries are designated uh, as, as CPCs. In the meantime, uh, we are continuing to raise our concerns directly uh, with the Indian government, um, with uh, in the in, with collaboration from our embassy uh, in New Delhi. We're speaking about these issues privately uh, with the Indians and and raising it, raising them publicly as well, um, as we did when we had our uh, rollout of the International Religious Freedom Report and and, and my remarks today and uh, yesterday uh, at, at the Earth Summit. Um, and so we're we're now going to be entering the process by which we take a look at. Uh, you know which countries uh, be, become uh, designated, and and I appreciate uh, your leadership, um, Congresswoman, uh, on this issue on on, on shedding light on uh, the concerns that we that we have uh, in India and of course so many other places around the world. And we we'll, we look forward to continuing to work with you and your staff uh, to keep you updated uh, on our latest work there. Uh, th thank you. Um, and, and, you know, as uh, Chairman Smith uh, was, was saying earlier, you know, with, with Boko Haram, uh, the, the designating them as, as a terrorist, there was a paper trail, there was evidence, there was everything that was available to, to us to be able to designate them as a terrorist organization. And I, 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 I believe with um, recommendation from you serve three years in a row, um, is a documentation, uh, and I do hope that that leads uh, you all in uh, deciding to designate um, uh, India as as a as a country of concern. Um, so one thing I might just add, Congressman, is that 
India is a country where, you know, a, a country that's a city that's considered a small city in India is, is a big city almost anywhere else in the world. And some of these cities are so densely populated that all it takes is, is a spark. And we've seen communal violence uh, take so many lives there. I, I also want to condemn there was a beheading of a Hindu, uh, a, a person, a tailor, uh, Hindu tailor um, in India a couple of days ago. Um, uh, who had apparently posted on social media support for uh, the woman who uh, had uh, made statements about uh, the Prophet Muhammad and uh, was was killed uh, and beheaded uh, uh, viciously uh, and uh, actually occurred on social media. So, you know, we're concerned how about how violence takes place against all communities uh, and how um, there's retaliatory uh, attacks uh, that can never be justified. Of course, the taking of any innocent life can never be justified. Uh, and so we do see warning signs that the situation uh, is is getting out of hand. And and it, it, it when these types of things occur, it has the potential to derail other parts of our strategy with regard uh, to India. And so we want to make sure that we're also seeing the clear connection between the human rights violations and, the, and our broader uh, bipart our, our broader uh, bilateral relationship. I, I appreciate you um, uh, br bringing that uh, uh, piece and, and, and for your uh, co condemnation um, of that. And um, and it is it's that spark uh, that that is terrifying um, when, you know, in in cases like Rwanda or um, Bosnia and, and others uh, laying the grounds for the the, the conditions uh, for ultimate genocide takes decades, uh, and the the spark is lit instant, uh, and mass casualties uh, happen. And we just want to make sure that we are doing everything that we can today, um, and not condemning genocide tomorrow. Uh, so I, I really do do appreciate um, your feedback uh, in that and um, your your concern for that. Um, in Sri Lanka, another um, uh, it's another uh, situation that we have been uh, closely following in in what's happening to to Muslims and other religious um, minorities. Can you say a little bit about what your work um, has looked like in Sri Lanka? I know that uh, we talked to your predecessor um, uh, a lot uh, about Sri Lanka and just wanted to see um, if you can give us an update on some of the work that you've been doing in Sri Lanka. Yeah, we've been in close uh, communication with the government. I've met with the ambassador two or three times already to, to, to raise our concerns and they've, they've been responsive. Uh, we've been having discussions with them about how um, some of their uh, counter-terrorism authorities are used, some of their broad definitions of extremism, how they're used to target um, groups and so they've uh, come back to us with some uh, suggestion that, um, that 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 they have um, uh, proposals in place to to address some of the the the, the over breadth uh, that exists in some of the language that we're using. So we are uh, in communication uh, uh, with them uh, in that regard. Um, also, other uh, policies that they had implemented in terms of uh, mandatory cremation. Um, and other uh, policies that a disproportionate impact on the Muslim community, we've raised directly with them. And we are seeing some progress uh, in, in, in those areas, but we want to make sure that we uh, continue to raise uh, all of these issues uh, until we see uh, market improvement over a sustained period of time. Thank, thank you. Um, I also wanted to, to talk a little bit about um, uh, treatment of Muslim uh, Muslim migrants and refugees around the world um, in Europe, where we've seen an um, outpouring of support for Ukrainians fleeing the war in their country. We've seen a different reaction for Syrians and Afghans who are fleeing war in their countries. It has fueled the rise of dangerous right wing governments in Hungary and elsewhere. Um, and just this week, dozens of mostly Sudanese um, and South Sudanese migrants were killed at the Moroccan uh, Spanish border. What is the what should the United States be doing and what could what can you do in your role to better combat the, uh, the problem of violence against Muslim migrants and asylum seekers and refugees? Well, first and foremost, uh, you know, we want to make sure that we're doing everything we can in, in our uh, power uh, as the United States to welcome, continue to welcome refugees to the United States. 
Um, and so we're uh, active in, in, in conversations in our government to make sure that we're doing everything that we can to, to bring people to the United States and, and to resettle them here uh, in ways that they can uh, build their lives. With our with regard to European governments, these are issues that we raise regularly. I, I recently met with the with the French ambassador, for example, um, and we want to make sure that the laws that they put in place, um, which have a powerful signal, uh, reflect laws and policies reflect um, the, the idea that um, all people of all faiths are going to be treated equally. So we've raised concerns, for example, about. Um, uh, restrictions on religious attire, um, uh, slaughter laws that affect um, uh, Jewish communities and Muslim communities. Uh, and we've also raised our concerns uh, about uh, rhetoric that's used to target uh, particular communities and, and sends the wrong signal uh, by giving the impression that somehow these uh, communities are, are, are acceptable scapegoats for some of the problems uh, that, that we're seeing uh, in Europe, including you know, when there's economic issues, uh, oftentimes it's these communities that are blamed and in in, in in immigrants and refugees uh, from other countries. So doing whatever we can to you know support those communities directly, and then also raising the issues um, with the governments and calling out uh, policies which we find to be sometimes uh, discriminatory or targeting particular uh, religious groups, and ensuring that um, they, they, that they do everything they can to keep. Uh, the rhetoric at at a level that uh, doesn't escalate the situation. Thank you. Uh, I yield back, uh, Chairman. Thank you very much, and um, I appreciate uh, both of you being here today and I, your excellent testimony. And um, thank you for your leadership on these issues. and um, And we look forward to continuing to work with both of you. So I appreciate it. Uh, uh, now we go to our second panel, uh, which consists of Nori Turkel who is the chair of the U.S. Commission on International Religious Freedom, USERF. Uh, uh, he is a Uyghur American lawyer, foreign policy expert, and human rights advocate. In September 2020, he was named one of the Time, one of the, uh, Time Magazine's 100 most, most influential people in the world. And in May 2021, he was named on Fortune's list of the world's 50 greatest leaders. He's a senior fellow at the Hudson Institute and a member of the Council on Foreign Relations. He serves as the chairman of the board for the Uyghur Human Rights Project, which he co-founded in 2003. Previously, he served as the president of the Uyghur American Association and as an advisor to multiple presidents of the World Uyghur Congress. Turkel uh, received an MA in International Relations and a JD from the American University. We are happy to have you here, and the floor is yours for your testimony. Thank you very much. Thank you, Co-Chair McGovern, Co-Chair Smith, uh, Representative Omar, and members of the Commission for holding this timely hearing on the persecution of uh, Muslims, and for inviting the U.S. Commission on International Religious Freedom, USERF, to testify. As an independent, bipartisan U.S. federal agency, we dedicated to uh, monitor uh, and promote um, religious freedom around the world uh, based on uh, universal uh, right to freedom and religion or belief. Uh, throughout the year, we monitor religious freedom uh, conditions abroad and make policy recommendations to the President, uh, Department of State, and Congress. With the State Department's determination last year that the Burmese and Chinese government's atrocities against the Muslim majority groups constitute genocide and crimes against humanity, and with anti-Muslim hatred uh, continuing to manifest it itself around the world, it varied in various ways, this hearing could not be more pressing. The Chinese government's systematic policies to forcibly assimilate Uyghurs and other Turkic Muslims and destroy their distinct ethno-religious identities are now well documented. Uh, the government has arbitrarily, in, arbitrarily incarcerated millions of Uyghurs and Kazakhs and other Muslims in concentration camps prisons, forced labor camps for a variety of religiously related reasons. Former detainees and witnesses reported physical and psychological torture, rape and other forms of uh, sexual violence, forced labor, forced sterilization, abortion while in custody. Moreover, the uh, authorities, the Chinese Communist Party has have separated as many as 880,000 Muslim children from their parents 
and destroyed and desecrated important religious and cultural sites throughout the northwestern part of China. In 2017, the Burmese military perpetuated mass killings and rapes against Rohingya Muslims in Rakhine, Rakhine State, forcing over 745,000 people to flee to Bangladesh within days. Each year since 2017, hundreds of thousands of Rohingyas continue to flee due to, on, to do the ongoing violence against them. Across Europe, anti-Muslim bias exists through laws, discrimination in public institutions, prejudice in immigration process, online harassment, and violent attacks. In France, for example, a 2021 law targeting so-called Islamist separatism strengthened the state, <clears throat> state oversight of mosques and other Islamic organizations. The government now has the power to close houses of worship and dissolve religious organizations without court order if any members are accused of provoking violence or inciting hatred. In addition, a religious organization must obtain a government permit every five years and are subject to annual audit if they receive foreign funding. Critics of this new law say that it gives the uh, government too much power over civic and religious groups and unfairly target Islam in a country where Muslims have faced decades of discrimination, hate crimes, and marginalization. In Austria, a government map showing the look, uh, look, locations of more than 600 mosques and Muslim associations in the country ostensibly to fight political Islam raise concerns of fostering ill will towards Muslim groups and endangering their safety. Muslim women in Germany continue to be denied job opportunities because they wear headscarves. Elsewhere, state repression undermines the right of the Muslims who descend from government's prescribed version of Islam. In Saudi Arabia, Bahrain, Shia Muslims continue to be facing ongoing systematic government discrimination in the areas of employment, political representation, and freedom of expression. Sunni Muslims in Iran face discrimination, arrest, sentencing on suspicious charges. In Pakistan, Ahmadiyya Muslims continue to face severe government persecution for their beliefs and self-identification as Muslims. In 2021 alone, the Ahmadiyya community in the country reported 40 uh, in in the country reported 49 police cases for reasons of faith, as well as the desecration of 121 Ahmadiyya graves and 15 places of worship by mobs, often assisted by the authorities. The governments also repress Muslims through the use of purposefully vague extremism laws that target people who peacefully practice their faith outside of government approved institutions. These methods are around the world, but particularly in Russia, Central Asia, states such as Tajikistan and Uzbekistan. I recently uh, returned from a Yusuf delegation to Uzbekistan where we heard how peaceful Muslims continue to be detained, imprisoned, or harassed simply for practicing their faith independently, including for uh, possessing religious uh, literature, teaching their faith to the next generation, or praying with others outside of government-approved spaces. In addition, in addition to the government persecution, non-state actors in many regions around the world prevent individuals and groups from living out their faith, their convictions to have no faith at all. These terrorist groups such as Boha, uh, Boko Haram in Nigeria, Al-Shabaab in Somalia and Kenya, and Houthis in Yemen, and the multiple ISIS affiliated groups in several different regions violently target anyone who does not conform their extremist ideology, including any other interpretation of Islam. In fact, these groups often operate in Muslim majority areas, killing, injuring, kidnapping Muslims for practicing their faith and their values according to their own conscience. Lastly, I'd like to propose some policy recommendations to help stem the tide of rising violence and discrimination against the global Muslim community. Uh, to start, refugee settlement programs should be prioritized uh, those individuals and groups who are most vulnerable, including Muslim victims of the most egregious forms of religious persecution, such as Uyghurs from China, Rohingya from Burma, Ahmadis from Pakistan, and Hazari Shias from Afghanistan. In fact, Congress should uh, could create by law 
a priority two, uh, or P2 designation for members of religious minority groups at extreme risk of persecution by the Taliban. This alone would go a long way uh, towards supporting Muslim, Muslims persecuted in this particular context in Afghanistan. Also, the State Department has applied waivers on four CPC designated countries that heavily persecute Muslims, Saudi Arabia, Pakistan, Tajikistan, and Turkmenistan. This essentially releases the US government from taking legislative mandated punitive actions as a result of a CPC designation. To address this, Congress should urge the administration to review US policy towards these countries and make appropriate policy changes to demonstrate meaningful consequences and encourage positive change. It should be clear from what we uh, what I have shared that persecution of Muslims is not sporadic or random. It involves both systematic and egregious repression, the violence, the violent targeting of members of this diverse faith community in the range of countries across the world, um, much as Christians, Jews, and others targeted in many places globally. As advocates of international religious freedom of diverse phases and beliefs and none and of none, we must re uh, refrain from discussions about which groups is most persecuted and instead of work on behalf of each other to ensure that members of all religious communities, including Muslims, can live and worship as they see fit. Religious freedom abuses, whether caused by the government action or inaction, cannot be unchallenged. Research has found that countries that uphold religious freedom have more vibrant and democratic political institutions, rising economic and social well-being, uh, diminished tension of violence, and greater stability. Nations that trample on or fail to protect basic human rights, including religious freedom, and provide fertile grounds for poverty, uh, insecurity, war and terror, violent, radical movements and activities. We have seen this in a number of countries already. Thank you very much for the opportunity to testify and look forward to your questions. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Turkel. And um, let me ask, um, you know, we know that the refoulement uh, of Uyghurs is an important problem. Uh, and is this, pro is this problem specific to the Uyghurs or does it affect Muslims who have fled other countries as well? I think the uh, refoulement uh, in, in specifically some of the countries that we monitor, uh, namely Pakistan, uh, Kazakhstan also has a, has a history of refoulement. Uh, in Southeast Asian countries, uh, Vietnam, uh, Cambodia, and also uh, in the Middle East, uh, Egypt, uh, Saudi Arabia. Uh, we also have uh, a documented um, uh, cases where uh, individuals, refugees, uh, disappeared uh, in Turkey. So um, it is still ongoing process, but when we reach out to various governments, uh, namely Kazakhstan, they reported that uh, they have been assisting the Kazakh uh, individuals who have taken up a citizenship in, uh, in Kazakhstan, who originally from China end up caught up in the concentration camp system. So some countries have been trying to help uh, in the case of Kazakhstan, as I noted, and also uh, the Turkish government has also have been issuing a, 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 a temporary uh, uh, residency cards to uh, certain individuals. But this is not a systematic uh, a government approved process. It's kind of a case by case uh, process. Uh, in some countries, uh, to, to make the matters worse to those refugees, there's so much derogatory information uh, uh, in the government system that prevents them to be even uh, provided basic uh, uh, means to stay in the country. Uh, about two months ago, uh, Saudi Arabia tried to deport uh, a mother and daughter back to China through various um, uh, contacts uh, by civil society uh, representatives, including USERF. Uh, we have been able to stop that deportation for the time being, but we don't know if that will be permanent or at some point down the road they will be caving into the pressure by the Chinese government and let them uh, uh, take over or uh, transferred into the Chinese uh, security. Thank you. Uh, do, do you see a role that Muslim majority countries might play in collectively pressuring China to improve its policies toward Muslim minority groups? Uh, what are the obstacles, if any, to the strategy and, and how might they be overcome? It is extremely important, uh, Chairman. Um, uh, so far, the United States government has taken a leadership role, uh, responded uh, with your support, with uh, 
Congressman Smith's support and others' support, uh, we have at least two pieces of legislation been uh, enacted. Uh, a number of uh, serious punitive actions have been announced, but uh, this has been um, a, a doing alone type of uh, a, a work. Uh, we have some uh, modest support from our European allies and partners. Uh, in some instances, Turkey has been also spoken out. Uh, recently at the Islamic Conference, uh, Turkish Foreign Minister, uh, where Chinese Foreign Minister was present, uh, urged the Muslim communities to uh, speak out. Uh, it is important, uh, and uh, them staying silent or feigning ignorance is hypocritical, uh, to mildly put. Uh, specifically, individuals like uh, MBS, uh, who is uh, groomed to be the custodian of two holiest mosques for Muslims, uh, still uh, pampering Chinese government uh, for its treatment of the Uyghur Muslims. Uh, when it comes to um, a um, even the mildest um, a response, a public statement from the Muslim communities, I genuinely believe will resonate in the Chinese leadership's uh, thinking. Uh, their continued silence uh, will make it worse. One po uh, possible reason for these countries not being vocal, uh, in the case of Pakistan, uh, former Pakistani Prime Minister Imran Khan publicly acknowledged that they appreciate Chinese friendship. friendship and Chinese financial aid and support. And this has been the case in many countries. So how do we, how do we address this? I think we need to beef up our uh, public diplomacy efforts. We need to engage with a, a, a possible uh, candidate countries. Uh, so far, only Albania and Kosovo, uh, in addition to Turkey, have spoken out, uh, in the, even in the mild terms. We still need to um, uh, enlist support from countries like Indonesia and Malaysia. So uh, it is important, uh, it is possible. Um, and um, if I may uh, say this, I don't think that we have done as much as the Chinese have done to recruit them or get them on the right side of the history. And my final question, and the final question is the same ones I, I asked our previous panel. Um, if you could identify one action that Congress could take to counter anti-Muslim stigmatization, discrimination and persecution, what would that be? I think the uh, um, the public uh, discussion like this is very helpful. Uh, Ambassador um, uh, Hussein uh, mentioned his background. I'm also an immigrant. I also have a Muslim background. Uh, people need to see that an immigrant myself, like myself, uh, not only being allowed to build professional career, but now representing a government agency. That is, a, that this kind of stories need to be told. That will encourage some governments to take action uh, or move from inaction to some sort of action uh, in the case of countries that are listed in Europe in particular. In light of their background, in light of their history, the Europeans should join the effort in this. Uh, so, so that the, the public diplomacy effort is very important. And on a humanitarian grant, I think we should uh, we should continue to provide uh, support uh, to uh, victims of religious persecution uh, from uh, the countries that we've been discussing today. And um, and also, I I think that um, the the designation as the case of the Rohingya Muslims and the Uyghur Muslims is important because that gives the hope to the the Muslim uh, victims around the world who has been subject to atrocity crimes, that there will be justice, there will be a government and uh, group or community will be hearing them out. And finally, um, I think the, the, the P2 status is something that Congress should uh, consider. In the case of the Uyghurs, it's extremely important. The Uyghurs uh, who are being um, uh, kind of kicked around in, in Central Asia and the Middle East have no place to go. Uh, and this does not require diplomatic approval. This does not require some uh, geopolitical consideration. This is this can be done based on humanitarian consideration. Okay. Well, thank you very much. And I appreciate your leadership. I now turn this over to Co-Chair Smith. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chairman. And I, I just wanted to tell Nuri Turkel, the chairman, that how much we appreciate he and the commission's extraordinary work when it was created in 1998. It was to be a check and a balance, but also a significant aid 
uh, to the International Religious Freedom Office by providing uh, commentary, hopefully incisive commentary, and you've done that, and you've done it very, very effectively. Uh, you know, I read your reports, they're excellent. Um, you know, even when I disagree with something, I, I know that there, it's certainly well-meaning, but I especially want to thank you know, that you've called again for Nigeria uh, to be a CPC country. We pushed hard for years to have Vietnam as a CPC country when they were artificially taken off uh, during the Bush administration, it was a mistake by the Bush administration uh, in anticipation of a bilateral trade agreement. Uh, the, the day it happened, the bilateral trade, uh, uh, Hanoi was 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 waxing eloquent about how this has nothing to do with human rights. You have no right to tell us what to do on religious freedom. Uh, and they certainly have proven it. Uh, they have gotten far worse when it comes to religious freedom. Uh, forced uh, con uh, conversions and all the other things continue unabated. Uh, and I've been there many times, and, and I'm just shocked how we have abandoned uh, the people of Vietnam to a government that is so antagonistic towards faith. Uh, so I thank you for being that, um, that very, very important voice, and you yourself personally for your leadership. It's extraordinary. Just a couple of quick questions. Um, you know, uh, as you know, and it was mentioned in the earlier conversation, you know, when Secretary Pompeo designated Xinjiang and what the Chinese Communist Party is doing to the Uyghurs and others there uh, as a as a genocide, uh, thankfully there was absolute seamlessness with the uh, Biden administration and Secretary of State Blinken, and my hope is that we will do even more. I mean, this is in real time as we talk, as we meet here today. Uh, Muslims are being horribly mistreated. Forced abortion is common. Forced sterilization is common. Uh, it fits every one of the criteria in the genocide convention, uh, and, and including taking children away. I remember when I first met Rabia Kadir back in 2005, I actually had her come and testify at a hearing uh, after meeting her in this office and hearing just how they retaliated against her family right. uh, for speaking out. <clears throat> now they're going against in the entirety of her extended family as well, including journalists at Radio Free Asia uh, who have spoken out. So the, the, the long arm, short arm, the, the cruel arm of Xi Jinping continues unabated. And I think we need to ratchet up uh, all of our, and I'm talking about Congress too, our efforts. Um, yes, the legislation went into effect just a couple of days ago. It was a great start. Uh, but Xi Jinping personally needs to be held to account for what he has unleashed upon the Muslims. He's done it against the Christians. He's done it against Tibetan Buddhists, the Falun Gong. But what he's done is is an atrocity. He should be at the Hague for crimes against humanity and genocide uh, and being held to account and prosecuted uh, the way Charles Taylor and Slobodan Milosevic and so many others have been uh, in the past. So I just uh, throw that out as, as a concern, but also a thank you to you. I also just on France, uh, Léa Cité, which is one of their 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 uh, uh, into their constitution uh, going back to 1905. Uh, it's kind of like this this um, um, idea of secularism, but it's very aggressive. Yeah. And they're using that against the Muslims, they're using that against the Jews uh, for, with outward appearance. And I think we need to push back on that. And, you know, they don't get a right to say, you know, certain garb is precluded uh, simply because our constitution says that's not a good thing. How dare they? Uh, they're also doing it with slaughter laws and circumcision, as is some of Europe. And there, the Muslim leaders are joining in solidarity with the uh, the Jewish leaders uh, to try to push back. Uh, and I'm working uh, on that here in the Congress, uh, along with uh, Ben Cardin over on the Senate side. Uh, that is wrong, too. So I know that uh, you're very well aware of that. You might want to comment on that. And, and then just um, uh, finally... Um, I guess that's it. I, I, I do have to go and do a presentation. I can't stay too much longer. I apologize for that. But Nuri, if you could just give a few thoughts on that. Uh, yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. On the uh, the uh, the European uh, it, a, a concern a concern, concerning trend line in Europe, um, Representative Ilhan Omar was spot on that uh, um, when U Ukrainian crisis started, the response was very quick, both from the government and societal level and in the business community as you know uh congressman uh it's been six years this genocide is underway in china we haven't had even one company one american company or global brand even acknowledge that there's a problem in china and there's no single company that pull out of business or let alone uh you know publicly making a statement 
Um, so that kind of uh, a, a unity, that kind of a moral response is lacking. Uh, and I can, I can, I have to be uh, quite up undiplomatic because we know that these companies, those governments, the society, community leaders know that it's very costly for them to call out China. So we already have seen this. This can be done in Europe uh, to protect the Ukrainian community. The European community should also protect their own fellow citizens and also call out, show that kind of solidarity to the Rohingya Muslims and, and the Uyghur Muslims. It's doable. So uh, we don't, we cannot, uh, we should not do a ch ch cherry picking when we are calling out a dictatorial regime, genocidal regime. The same standard should be apply, apl applicable to everyone. On that point, too, when we had our hearings on the Genocide Olympics, uh, I asked specifically Coca Cola and others, um, you know, if they couldn't, they just like clammed up. They couldn't say the word genocide. Uh, Nike is the same way. You know, they're making billions of dollars with access. If only, and you know, the, the past is instructive too. When, when after Tiananmen Square, uh, I and I worked with Speaker Pelosi and Frank Wolf and David Bonnier from Michigan, it was a good bipartisan coalition. We said, let's have conditionality on China. Uh, with regards to trade and um, the business community and many others here in Congress said, oh, no, they'll matriculate into a into a democracy if we just trade more. Nothing. We said that's not going to happen. Never happened in the past. Why would it happen now? And it hasn't happened. Uh, they've gotten worse. And now they have a military that's increasingly second to none uh, with the ability to project power, uh, but also unbelievably so the ability uh, to coerce, hurt, destroy and inflict unspeakable acts of cruelty on their own people. And the Muslims, um, you know, the world needs to speak out even more. Uh, you know, it's almost like there's a compassion fatigue that sets in. Uh, yeah, we did that. We spoke out. Now what's new when you turn the page? Not for the prisoner who's being tortured uh, as we meet here today. So I, I thank you for what you guys are doing. It's just amazing. Now, Jim has had to step out for a moment. I'm heading over to a speech uh, at the Religious Freedom Summit. Uh, so I, I, uh, if, if Ms. Omar could take over, uh, we'd all appreciate it. Thank you. I will do that, Chairman. Thank, thank you. So I'll thank see you at the summit. <laughs> and Ben, thank you so much for speaking so passionately for the Uyghurs. Truly appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Um, uh, Mr. Turkle, uh, when you testified um, before the Foreign Affairs Committee last year, we talked a little bit um, about the relationship be between um, the American war on terror and uh, China's policy towards the Uyghurs. Yes. We talked about the connections between U.S. policy choices and the Chinese government's labeling uh, Uyghurs as terrorists. Yes. I wonder if you could say a little bit more about that today. Um, I don't. Um, I I don't uh, miss word when it comes to this because I lived through uh, this disastrous policy that was announced by the Bush administration uh, right after 9/11. I was a law student. Um, that was the time that I started my Uyghur advocacy work. Um, as expected, China has been extremely effective uh, to our disadvantage using uh, war on terror as, as an excuse. Even to this day, when you listen to them, uh, even the way that they had uh, UN High Commissioner for Human Rights to justify some of their policies, they still to this day use uh, extremism, uh, terrorism, and Islamic fundamentalism as an excuse. The word terrorism does not even uh, exists in the Uyghur dictionary. Uyghurs are very uh, a, a peaceful uh, Muslim people. Uh, as you may know that some Uyghurs still practice um, and now quietly the Sufi version of Islam, which is very romantic uh, and modern version. So I think the United States- is what I was raised with, so yes. I'm very quite familiar with. So, so the United States government bears responsibility. I was very pleased when um, uh, uh, Secretary Pompeo, or former Secretary of State Pompeo, uh, revoked that East Turkestan Islamic Movement uh, designation. That was the disastrous beginning. I, 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 I think it's I think it's reasonable to say this. If that decision was not made uh, in 2002, 2003 by the Bush administration, I don't think that the China would have been as bold as today. 
I think that paved the way for China to come up with this draconian surveillance policies, uh, the anti-Islam, anti-Muslim policies, or now turn into a genocidal actions. So I think the United States government should publicly acknowledge as uh, Richard Boucher, a former spokesperson said that this was something China asked the United States government to do. So, um, and, and this also helped the Europeans and some, even some Muslim countries to echo Chinese uh, counterterrorism claim. And also the, the academics and the media ha should share some responsibility, even to this day, uh, Representative Omar, some media, some level-headed, some reasonable uh, uh, policy expert quote what the Chinese government says when it comes to uh, terrorism claim. And that has never been verified independently. The fact that the China says it three times does not make it true. It's just a convenient and also make the matters worse. We're just talking about global anti-Muslim uh, sentiment. That same standard, same justification have been adopted by other countries. So, so using terrorism excuse uh, is, has been very convenient politically to various governments. I recently engaged with the Central Asian governments. I asked a very specific, uh, very basic question. What is your standards uh, identifying, labeling somebody a uh, religious extremist? And what, what law, what uh, internationally accepted standard that you follow? The answer was very disappointing, SCO. Shanghai Cooperation Organization that is set up by uh, at the urging of Russia and China. So if the Islamic, uh, the extreme uh, radical extremism uh, definition is based on the concept promoted by Russia and China, then we have a serious problem. Um, and uh, we also uh, at that hearing um, discussed the, the role of American corporations and you've alluded to that a little bit earlier. Um, and American individuals like Eric Prince uh, play in holding uh, the system of concentration camps in Xinjiang. Um, it sometimes feels to me as if all of Congress's attention um, to the to the Uyghurs, uh, we still are not doing enough. Um, I know that Chairman uh, McGovern and Smith led the effort on forced labor, and I was proud to support it. But what more can be done um, uh, to prevent uh, Americans from profiting off the atrocities taking place in Xinjiang? The, uh, <clears throat> with your support and other members of support, the, the Uyghur uh, Forced Labor Prevention Act is a good start. But the, but the question now is how uh, effectively, fully, that law would be implemented. Um, I have been advocating a full implementation uh, publicly uh, uh, through public statements and, 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 and discussion in this kind of public forum. Uh, that would be a good start. And also, I think that the American people, uh, we have the legal tools now. If it's been implemented, if it's implemented, that may we may see some positive outcome. But at the same time, we cannot uh, lose sight over the American complicity, the consumer cons complicity, the investor complicity, uh, and others who are trying to water down, who are trying to continue to fund and and invest in Chinese businesses. The, the Uyghur genocide is very unique in many aspects. One, it involves uh, technology, the most sophisticated forms of technology. Last December, the Biden administration um, added Chinese Military Medical uh, Institute uh, Academy and its 11...
in the competition aspect because we're talking about solar panels we're talking about uh the construction materials we're talking about apparel we're talking about ppes we're talking about uh, women's beauty product so everything that american people touch essentially has something to do with the Uyghur genocide so this should be a whole of government uh, 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 should be should be a, a a concern for the entire United States government, not only for the Congress and and, and few uh, 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 departments in the uh, executive branch. This should be the matter for uh, the European allies. And finally, something uh, you and I may uh, uh, agree that why we don't have we should have a representing representation. Uh, ambassador level representation at the Islamic uh, 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 Corporation of Islamic Org uh, Organization IOC. So the the uh, it used to have Ambassador Rashad Hussein used to be a special representative. It has been downgraded. So without engaging those fifty six countries, we cannot uh, expect them to do something right. So we need to we need to be we need to do a better job, and we need to have a seat on the table. We need to be vocal uh, as uh, China has been in these uh, forums. And do you believe that with the legislation to stop um, uh, forced labor uh, um, products, that that helps with um, some of the concerns that you were talking about, about, you know, every aspect of um, our lives being touched by um, products that were produced by forced labor? If, if, uh, if it's fully uh, effectively implemented, yes. Um, this bill, arguably the most important legislative mandate that Congress put in place since China joined the WTO to address some of the lingering issues. Okay. The existing uh, laws, uh, the resources were insufficient. And this is, uh, if you listen to the reaction from the Chinese government, uh, including the official spokesperson, it, it, it can sense the anger. That means that uh, this is reaching uh, to to the policy circle in, within the Communist Party, and you know, the two things for the Chinese government are very important. One is the public image, so they continue to call them out. Uh, this is why the uh, genocide determination was extremely important in bipartisan fashion, and also the other uh, uh, important thing for the Chinese Communist Party is their economic interest. Mm -hmm. So through this bill. Uh, we would at least help to clean up, uh, help to minimize the uh, the exports coming to the United States. The the world twenty percent of world's cotton are sourced in the Uyghur homeland. Eighty percent of the cotton uh, uh, in China, the cotton products are sourced in the Uyghur homeland, mm -hmm. and that gives you a pretty good idea. The solar panels that we put on a rooftop. Yeah. Um, with a two years moratorium, a, a, a moratorium, it will still will be coming to the United States. So, um, uh, and now we just find out that the the uh, some of the construction materials, uh, based on the latest um, uh, report uh, by Laura Murphy, suggest that uh, reports that uh, some of the construction materials for home builders also made by Uyghur slaves. So, um, it, you know, the consumer activism, in addition to uh, the governmental actions, is ex extremely important. That's how you get the, uh, the investors, the businesses uh, hear from you. So I, you know, using this opportunity, encourage uh, the American consumers to do their bidding, their job, uh, a bare minimum, put back those baby pajamas made in China. Because mm -hmm. we, we, yeah, that is true that the American public does have a responsibility to educate themselves and um, not not help China profit from forced labor. Um, I mentioned to Ambassador Hussein during the first panel that I had recently introduced a resolution calling on the State Department to accept your recommendation that uh, India be listed as country of concern. Um, can can you say a little bit more about why um, that you all have recommended three years in a row that India be listed as a country of concern? Um, <clears throat> Representative Omar, we always um, miss the early warning sign. Mm -hmm. It will be just empty talk uh, if we repeat ourselves saying that um, we need to prevent genocide. 
how do you prevent genocide when you see early signs, warning signs, you need to take action. Somebody who lived through, uh, in the past 10 years at least, three genocidal acts, Yazid against, one against Yazidis and the Burmese and the Uyghur Muslims, I worry if we fail, if fail to address this publicly call out or do whatever we do uh, governmentally, then this will become a much bigger problem to deal with. Our government uh, and other governments often make a mistake when we see uh, religious persecution at its worst form, uh, uh, human rights abuses. We don't act until it becomes bigger humanitarian crisis, war, uh, war, war, genocide. So in the case of uh, India, the reason that we've been focusing on this is to prevent this to turn into something unthinkable. Why would we deal with something that becomes worse? We can prevent this. At the same time, geopolitically speaking, uh, we can have a normal relationship with India while calling them out uh, uh, on the things that are not doing right. Uh, India is a country uh, recently had a Muslim president and now treating their Muslim population and other religious groups in a way it's, uh, is, does not fit with their political tradition. So, so the, it's good for the Indian people, Indian government officials to put away their nationalistic views and, and try to listen. As I noted, they don't need to do the things they have been to, to stabilize the country. Uh, in the case of China, for example, they spend more money on domestic uh, security as opposed to national defense. So in a way that they're afraid of their own people. So India, instead of spending that much energy uh, uh, and, and resources, they should go back to the traditional way that India was known to the world. So um, the problems are very serious. The citizenship law, uh, you know, inflammatory yeah, I, I, I... Yes, I was going to say, what, 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 what are you seeing that has made you want to list India as a country of concern? Can you? I think the government inaction is, is, is extremely important. India is a democratic country. We're not talking about some uh, dictatorship. So if the, if the Indian government, uh, prime minister himself, publicly condemns uh, the anti-Muslim, anti-other uh, religious group rhetoric in the society, it will resonate. Uh, so so the, the governmental inaction is a big problem. In the societies, when the government uh, educate the public of tolerance, religious tolerance, promote diversity, then people, it will resonate in people's thinking. I think the, the government inaction, in my mind, is the biggest problem right now. Mm -hmm. And um, what do you think is the holdup so far um, under both Trump and the Biden administration in designating India? Because we do have a history of designating partner countries um, as countries of concern. Right. So the one comparative uh, analysis can be shared. Um, I don't know the uh, specific answer to that question, um, but I can see that there is some geopolitical uh, consideration. If the geopolitical consideration is a valid concern, then we should also look at how the United States government, even with the CPC designation of uh, People's Republic of China, year after USERF was established, uh, we still have a diplomatic relationship. Uh, and United States and China has had intimate economic relationship. So it's possible to walk and chew gum at the same time. So if, if you honest to your friends, if let's say India and the United States have a very friendly relationship, so India should be able to hear an honest criticism from the United States government and American people for the betterment of the country. And we can, you know, we should, our good relationship should not be incumbent upon uh, our withholding our public criticism. Uh, private criticism is good, but sometimes it's more effective to publicly call any government out for their uh, human rights abuses. Mm -hmm. And for um, the those who might not know what is the significance of um, designating a country as a country of concern, can you say a little bit more about that? What does that actually mean? 
and what does the, it do? The uh, <clears throat> the CPC designation is important. Uh, for example, we have um, designated and uh, recommended in 2020 uh, a number of countries. Uh, for example, Afghanistan, Nigeria, uh, India, and uh, we uh, Syria. But uh, the countries like Burma, China, Eritrea, Iran, North Korea have already been in the CPC list. CPC designation is important uh, because this will make those uh, countries, those regime, the governments, uh, uh, we deny their opportunity to remain anonymous. This will raise public awareness. This will put pressure on the government to reform, uh, 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 repeal some of the repressive policies. This is very uh, real in some countries. Some governments legislate anti-religion, anti-particular uh, ethnic group or religious group type of uh, legislative mandate. So CPC designation is extremely important because their policies, uh, the way that they treat their religious group is egregious, continuing uh, ongoing. So we use um, uh, this kind of public uh, designation to help to improve the lives of the uh, religious minorities in various countries. And uh, in in your work, um, how dangerous is it when countries move um, towards uh, the creation of an ethno state? It is. Um, it, it's. It's. Uh, um, in. A, in. A, for example, in the case of Nigeria, um, we disagreed with the State Department, and we know now that uh, it's getting worse. So, if you allow uh, the government to continue by normalizing their behavior, then we're not in the position. Not only not in the position to protect the vulnerable religious ethnic group. In a way. We will embolden uh, unwittingly the bad actors to commit, continue to commit those uh, atrocities. Um, I want to um, thank you uh, for um, for your work, for your um, advocacy. Um, and uh, for for not holding back. Um, and I want to end maybe with one um, last question. Uh, I know that both McGov uh, Chairman McGovern and Chairman Smith um, have talked to you a little bit about uh, the what the silence from Muslim majority countries uh, means uh, for uh, Muslim minorities that are being persecuted and genocided against uh, around the world. Um, and I, I do wholeheartedly agree um, with your assessment in that regard. Um, but I also wanted to ask what it actually means when there are countries, uh, Muslim majority countries, specifically countries like Saudi Arabia, um, that help and perpetuate um, uh, this this war on terror narrative and um, and using um, th that that rhetoric to uh, help fund and carry out um, uh, Islamophobic um, policies uh, and and think tanks um, around the world. Um, I think. The, the number of things should be and could be done. Um, I, in, I, I urge the US government to, to do more uh, publicly. Uh, our public diplomacy efforts have not been sufficient. Uh, whereas China has been investing a lot of time and energy. Um, they have been doing a lot of high level visits to those two countries. And they've been uh, telling a bunch of inaccurate statements about the United States and, and presenting themselves as a kind of softer version of a global power, saying we built schools, hospitals, roads for you, whereas the United States comes to destroy your cities and kill your citizens. And those rhetoric, uh, those uh, 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 messages, narratives resonating in certain countries so I, I think uh, more engagement with public, uh, 
in a uh, in countries like Indonesia and uh, Malaysia, uh, Turkey, maybe even Egypt, uh, may make difference if we can achieve um, through a bilateral, multilateral engagement with uh, the countries, those countries, at least to prevent them joining the Chinese uh, team. Uh, you know, former Secretary of State used to say that China has its own team when it comes to uh, human rights violations. He was referencing to the letter that the Chinese uh, mission uh, was able to rally at close to 40 countries, and this majority of them are Muslim countries. So the public diplomacy, I think, uh, efforts need to be uh, intensified. I think it's, it's, it's deeply um, uh, insufficient. And then the other uh, uh, aspect is um, we should... Um, uh engage with the uh civil societies uh you know some countries for example in turkey in malaysia indonesia there's a vibrant civil societies even though sometime in, in the case of turkey there's uh, individuals or civil society representatives have to be mindful about the government reaction but they are relatively free uh, to call them out and in the case of turkey the uyghurs are are, are very much uh, treated as as a siblings, like the brothers, uh, because of Uyghur's uh, ethno-religious uh, affinity with the people of Turkey and the historic relationship. So we should also activate our resources on the ground, uh, engaging with the civil societies to pressure the government. Uh, I think those are the things that we can we can done could have done. And and in in as part of USERF's mission, we have been also engaging with the embassies, diplomatic missions. Uh, to to get the message crossed, we're also encouraging the civil society representatives that we've been engaging with, meeting with, to uh, ask them to raise uh, a public concern uh, about uh, not only about their own uh, concerns and domestically, but uh, other Muslims. It's almost heartbreaking that we haven't heard a, a strong condemnation to this day. Uh, in the case of MBS, actually, he phrased the Chinese uh, leader, even though his look, his beard, his name, his way of saying even the salam alaikum, the sanction uh, could uh, get you into trouble with the authorities. He came around and actually phrased the Xi Jinping's treatment of uh, fellow Muslims. Um, well, uh, uh... Th thank you. Um, I'm now going to recognize the distinguished uh, gentlelady from Houston, Texas, um, uh, Congresswoman Sheila Jackson Lee, who might uh, have some questions for you. Thank you, Madam Chairwoman, and thank you to uh, co-chairs McGovern and Smith. Thank you, uh, Chair Turco. I have been listening. I'm in the middle of another policy mm -hmm. uh, Zoom. I wanted to make sure uh, that I had an opportunity, albeit very briefly, uh, to first of all, thank all the witnesses that were here uh, and uh, to emphasize the cruciality of the question of religious freedom, but also uh, what is happening. Um, with respect to um, uh, the Muslims around the world, let me start uh, uh, from what I have been listening to about our corporate community, the international corporate community, which seems to pick and choose what issues they think will be legitimate for them to relocate. For example, they were very proud uh, to relocate as Russia uh, attacked Ukraine. Okay. And so we've seen not all maybe, but one by one. In the instance of the violence against Muslims, the issues in China, the, the Uyghurs, which have been notorious in law um, they feel comfortable in staying there. So I only have a brief moment, but I want to pose um, these two questions. One, what can we do in the United States? There's quite a bit of legislation. I, I believe that there is something called shame or to, to highlight publicly as a nation, as a government, and that these issues are going on. And we would hope that corporations who uh, have value or uh, under a democratic system of government, i.e. the United States, um, would recognize that this is not a place for them to be, number one. The other question is with Russia and its treatment of Muslims. Uh, some of the Ukrainian um, prisons of war Muslims, 
uh, obviously Chechnya and what they've done there. Um, and I think Russia, even before or the Ukraine has gotten away uh, with uh, the abuse of Muslims by way of calling them terrorists. And I do support all of the countries that you've recommended when I say support your recommendations of concern. I think that is very important because lives are being lost. Obviously in Nigeria, there's a Christian Muslim fight as you well know, with Boko Haram uh, and there's a murder of others of religious faith. But we need to be able to stand up and recognize that murder of anyone for their faith is absolutely unacceptable. And if Muslims are being murdered from the regions of uh, Southeast Asia to the Asian Pacific and to the continent of Africa and beyond, uh, then we've got to find a way uh, that responds responsibly. So I'd appreciate your response on the corporate uh, shaming, if you will. And then of course, Russia and what is going on right now with Muslims being captured and then China, which they've been torturing for thank, very thanks. long. Thank you very much, very Congressman, much. for the question. Thank you. Um, uh, your first question is very important. Last year, uh, last December, um, Congress passed the Uyghur Forced Labor Prevention Act uh, and signed into law uh, by President Biden. And then two months after that law was passed, enact, uh, enacted a uh, number of American corporations, uh, Visa, Coca-Cola, Nike, Procter Gamble, went ahead to sponsor uh, the Genocide Olympics in February. Um, and they, caught, they suffered no cost. So Congress should consider uh, a legislation or legislative mandate to address uh, issues like that. Uh, the CECC hold a hearing um, before the Olympics and members of the commission uh, could not get one uh, representative or witness to even admit they are even aware of uh, the atrocity crimes committed uh, in, in the Uyghur homeland. So the Magnitsky uh, Accountability Act didn't appear to be applicable to those companies. The Uyghur Human Rights Pro uh, Policy Act did not have any provision that could be directly applicable, uh, even entities like International Olympic Committee. So, so Congress should look into the ways to go after uh, uh, entities like the, the, the OIC. Sorry, you muted. Congresswoman, you are muted. I'm listening to you. Thank you. Go oh, okay. Um, th thank you. Uh, as for the uh, the 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 uh, Russia's treatment of the Muslims, it has been um, you know in in some cases they've been uh, using the Muslim population. In the case of Chechnya, and in some instances they've been persecuting the Muslims. So it has been very inconsistent the way of uh, dealing with the Muslim population. And the the case of uh, the in the current crisis. Um, the uh, the Tatar Muslims in from Crimea is not getting enough attention. So so I that that is one uh, specific region and and group of people in the southern part of Ukraine uh, has a large Muslim population. They are a vibrant uh, Muslim population, and they were uh, they were enjoying all the rights. I remember talking to the representatives from the Crimean uh, community in 2006, uh, serving in the Ukrainian parliament. So Putin essentially destroyed that uh, a, a political representation from the Ukrainian uh, uh, Tatar community. So I um, and in in the as I noted alluded earlier, uh, Putin's uh, some of Putin's uh, unfriendly, hostile policies towards uh, Muslims have been part become a part of Shanghai Cooperation Organization policy agenda. So, so whatever the uh, Putin uh, thinking uh, formulation of various policies did not end up within the Russian Federation. Now it's been actually uh, used uh, in the cases of uh, Tajikistan and Turkmenistan. If you listen to them, it's essentially the same rhetoric that will come out uh, from that comes out from Moscow and Beijing. Let me um, thank you very much. You've given me several um, streams of thought, uh, igniting some additional resolutions that will respond. I am concerned um, 
because we certainly are champions and advocates for the empowerment of uh, business community, creating economic engines in our own country, and certainly want to be competitive around the world. And I've, obviously, one of our major competitors is China. Um, and I think that is what has been used as a response of we can't do anything. And so um, I think uh, we should uh, collaborate with the commission uh, more. And uh, as well, I will be focused on the other aspect of the Russian war, and that is against people and against Muslims and against minorities that we seemingly um, have not uh, focused in on. So thank you very much. I'm going to yield back and I thank you for uh, this hearing effort to um, never be silenced on the question of international and national human rights abuses. Thank you so very much. I yield back. Thank you. Thank you, Congresswoman um, Jackson Lee. Uh, and, and thank you to all of our Panelists and Mr. Turkle, um, we are grateful to Chairman uh, McGovern and Smith for helping convene uh, this really important discussion today um, and look forward to some of the action items that will uh, come out of it and look forward to having this discussion um, uh, furthermore in the future. Uh, with that, the meeting is adjourned. Thank you.